with soundtracks. I hope you are ready for this talk about for, by JN about hacking a set receiver. We will see some insights into firmware hacking and firmware formats, frame buffers, and uh, pet package pec peculiarities of the MIPS architecture. And uh, I have fun. All right. I have this small device here, a set satellite receiver, and it has some connectors here, something for the antenna, for USB, HDMI, uh, another something else, a SCART and a serial port. Uh, it's very useful for hacking things. And it has a bus, has a few buttons, very nice. And if you look inside, you can see there's some flash memory here. You can't really see it in the small picture. And here under the heatsink, there is a quite obscure uh, chip with uh, MIPS CPUs inside. And uh, to find out something about this, I read out the flash memory and looked at it and found this structure here. And there are some names which are readable, uh, AV, CPU, IMG, demo, and something about resource and logo. It's quite interesting already. And uh, there's just a partition table, apparently, where in the flash which data are stored. So I extracted that and looked further. And this is interesting already. Some of that is uh, LZMA compressed, uh, a common compression scheme. And in the middle, there is this uh, JPEG image logo. And this is really the manufacturer logo, but I replaced it, of course. And uh, this partition demo, which was quite high on the list, this is MIPS code if, if, you, if you decompress it and put it into a disassembler. And you can see some initialization, and it's the beginning of the uh, of the TV application that normally runs on this. And so how do I get my own code into this thing? Uh, at first, I wrote the absolute minimum that you can have a halfway useful code, a, a little loop that prints the letter R uh, to the serial port as often as possible. And uh, this installed this, and after uh, uh, some cursing because not everything was as I expected that that worked. And I got the letter A over the serial port, which is uh, was very nice to include it there, but it's not very useful, of course, this program. So I wrote another program into the flash memory, which is uh, it allows me to peek and poke in the memory and uh, registers of this of the periphery the peripherals to read and write in order to 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 interact with the hardware really and the next question is where is the frame buffer and from this hdmi port a, a, a picture is comes out there and I would like to influence that. And what helps, of course, is that after starting, the this logo is being displayed. So I, I wrote a little piece of code, which, um, which uh, can do a remote control of this monitoring program and looks through the memory and every four kilobytes uh, outputs, every every first th kilobytes. Um, and it's this is a memory range that looks interesting. There's a lot of nothing, and then a little bit, and then more nothing. And this seems to be similar to the picture of the, of the shark. And uh, if you look closer, you can see the, you can see the individual lines where it starts and uh, where it ends. And it's, of course, 1,922 1, bytes long. That is one, one scan line. And this is really HDMI on 1920 
by 1080. And um, so I thought, well, if I have found the frame buffer, maybe I could shift it and see what happens. And I would expect the, the shark to move up, but that didn't quite work. Only the color was changed, but not the luminosity. That was quite interesting. Uh, in, in other places, and in another place, I could uh, change the brightness in, independently of the color. So we have two frame buffers, one for for the um, color and one for the brightness. And I tried out a bit more, and it turned out that the color space uh, is, consists of these three components. Um, so. So it looks like like this. So it's YCBCR. It's a luminosity or luma, and a color value in blue and bluish and reddish. So that is chroma blue and chroma red signals. And um, the next thing, of course, is can we can we put Linux on it? Um, well, the manufacturer. You didn't use Linux, but something of, of its of own. So I had to create my own. But yes, Linux can run on this thing. Not really complete, but um, there's always room for improvement. Um, so how do does one port Linux? And um, the first thing you need is to give Linux the, the possibility to output something, anything, so you can see what happens. Uh, once for, for, for the code that, that takes the kernel and uncompresses it, and um, because that's to save space that is always stored in a compressed form, and so it has to be decompressed. And uh, on the MIPS architecture, it's the component Z boot and um, early print K is uh, does the same thing, but for the kernel after it has been loaded. And the driver in this in this place is, is quite short. It only needs to know how to output one single character. And so that was relatively quick to make. If you want to uh, 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 run uh, Linux on a MIPS chip, then you have to specify what is this. So, what's the name of the of my my chip family, and what can it do? And here, for example. I specified it's a 32-bit little Endian MIPS Z boot early print K has what I mentioned earlier, and and then we ha you have to write a couple of methods. What's the name of this of this device here, and what do, do I have to do to to find where my RAM is located in this device tree here, and Interrupts are very important too, if Linux is supposed to run on your, on your device. Here this chip ha has it, its own interrupt controller, which makes the interrupts coming from the different uh, peripheral devices uh, uh, come to the, uh, the CPU in an ordered way. So you have to write a couple of things like uh, how to demask an interrupt so that it can pass. How how am I, can I do the interrupt controller that I'm done and the next interrupt can come in and and then I declare in the device tree on the right hand side where this interrupt controller is located. Here there are two interrupt controllers listed here. The first one is the CPU interrupt controller, which is a standard component of of MIPS, and the and the lower one 
is one I wrote my own driver uh, for, and uh, those are con uh, connected uh, to each other. Well, this didn't really work uh, on the first try, so the uh, Linux uh, 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 hang up, hung up, crashed very early at the place where, at the point where the interrupts are passed to the uh, to the CPU. So at local IRQ enable, and which was a bit weird. Turns out that in the manual of this specific MIPS processor, which is list, which is in this device, MIPS 254K, there's it's documented that that there is a vectored interrupt mode. If and when I, in my, if I don't tell my Linux that this is this mode is supposed to be used, and uh, things uh, things go horribly wrong, and so <laughs> so the, so you can uh, just find this out by trying out things and what was happens. Next, I want to be able to use my serial port completely. Before I just had a minimal driver for that that can just uh, uh, send characters. But this doesn't really help help if I just want to interact with bash and enter commands, things like that. So the Linux system for serial ports and other stuff is uh, for T device, for teletypes, as it stands for, all kinds of terminals. So this Linux subsystem is a bit difficult. So, and has re rarely ever been uh, made more modern. So in total, these were 350 lines for some basic functionality necessary for that, for this driver, for the serial port. And, and at the end, it worked out. It worked out. USB would, would be nice too. I mean, there, there are USB ports at the device. And it's a some standard, it's a vanilla, USB controller um, built in there, in, in this device, called EHCI, so there's, which is a spec telling how a USB host controller could look like. Linux has drivers for that, of course, because EHCI is very common, but <laughs> I wasn't able to, uh, to get them running. It works a little bit, but it turns out that I plug in a device, but then when it tries to find out what device this is, uh, something stops working. And okay, so here, if you could help me, it would be really appreciated. So if so, if I if I uh, put my Linux uh, by serial device, this takes very, very long because this port has a maximum speed of uh, one megabyte, one million bits per second at the maximum, which at the optimum would take 20 seconds to, uh, to uh, transfer the whole Linux. But in practice, it's a couple of minutes for that. So I would really love to have a debugger, GDB-like. So there is some functionality for that in Linux. Uh, so you can uh, can GDB or any other kind of debugger, like Visual Studio Code Debugger, if something like this exists, you can uh, uh, connect to that. But this needs even more features in my driver for the serial port. So, so I haven't implemented that yet. Um, so. Hacking firmware is very interesting so so far. The worlds to uh, to discover. And I mean this device was like 26 euros in total and and porting Linux is just fun. It's for certain values of fun, of course. So yeah. So I'm done with, with my stuff. <laughs> Turns out. Any more information for this project, find at GitHub at neuschäfer slash m8hcs8001, which is the name of the chip uh, that's built in there. 
And any questions? If please, please don't. Okay, thank you very much for the exciting talk. This was a really nice use for for this device. Maybe use it to watch TV. So you can use it to watch TV, uh, but uh, that's that's boring. Yeah, I have one question so far, and that is, if you buy devices to hack them, what uh, what properties are you looking for, and what what could make it seem likely that it can hack is hackable? In this device, it's a serial port. It's a very very useful. That's a very important, a very simple way on hardware level and a software level to to get uh, data into a device and out of a device. Also to write interactive software for that. So, and to interact with uh, keyboard and screen. Is, is that common to have a serial port? Not that common, actually. Um, Oh, quite often you have to look at the uh, at the main board uh, uh, to to find some something like a serial port and maybe it doesn't even have any something else is this flash this flash chip this small one here four times five millimeters or something like that it's a zoic eight chip o e o e c eight o i c eight so it's very good because it's it's rather easy to connect to them with a with certain kind of um, um, needle card um, to uh, not needle card a, um, a connector to read to read out the flash okay thank you that's clear so if we have let's see if we have some questions in the meantime no sorry there are no more questions but thank you very much